Um, yeah, so today's presentation, um, hopefully you guys can stay awake for. Uh, I know that it's right after lunch, and there's a lot of head nodding after lunch, but that's all right. I, oh, there it is. I don't take offense to people sleeping. So what we're going to talk about today, adaptive monitoring and detection for today's landscape. It's a really long title. Um, half the time I can't remember even what I put for the title of the slide. Uh, but at the end of the day, what I want everyone to be able to do after this talk is to kind of like rethink and take a good look at how you at your organization actually do monitoring and detection and think about your incident response plans and how those actually work together and how to kind of, you know, look at what's out there right now and how you can actually improve your own program by throwing that in there. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the CISO at Binary Defense Systems. Uh, I've been doing this kind of stuff for over 15 years now. Uh, my specialty is uh, security operations, threat intelligence, and uh, incident response. In a former life, I created SOX and threat intelligence programs for Fortune 500s. Um, I have assisted three-letter agencies in profiling a cy uh, foreign cyber criminals. I refuse to do anything with U.S. nationals. Uh, former U.S. Marine, and if you, yep. <laughs> and if you want to follow me on Twitter, um, I'm at Bodoc. Zero. So the agenda. Uh, we're going to go over and over. We're going to do an overview of monitoring and detection, uh, and that's going to kind of go over what used to be the way to do it. Unfortunately, the way some people still do it. And then we're going to talk about a good way to do it. Same with incident response. Then we're going to go over some really good things that should be in an incident response plan. After that, we're going to go into actually more of the meat and potatoes of adaptive monitoring. Um, and then we're going to tie it all together. And if there's time, I'd actually like to have a discussion. Uh, there will be a question and answer sec uh, section as well. But I always like to throw in a little discussion piece. That way, you know, I can kind of gauge where everyone's going, make sure everyone got everything. And if there's anything, you know, people want to talk about, we can hit that as well. So let's get started. So you can't just have a lot of equipment. You can't just have a bunch of alerts coming in and somebody just staring at a screen watching for those alerts. If you really don't tune whatever it is you're using for monitoring, you're going to have a huge gap in your program. So no company can ever say, we're not going to get breached. We're solid. We're good to go. It's an impossible thing to say. However, if you have a good monitoring and detection program in place, you have a better chance of catching it and hopefully catching it before the data starts flowing out. So think about it. I don't want anyone to raise their hands or anything like that, but think about how you are today, whatever you're doing for monitoring. You know, think in your head, am I comfortable with this? Do I think that we're good to go? Yeah, we might get breached, but if we do, are we going to be able to see it? All the major companies that have had a breach, and the list is way too long to even start talking about, they thought that they had a good monitoring and detection program in place. All of them did have some form of monitoring and detection, whether it was in-house or it was through an MSSP. You need to monitor more than what you just see as a critical infrastructure. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people and talked to companies and been in companies, and they monitor, for example, it's a bank. Oh, we monitor our PCI zone. We monitor everything in there. Cool. Do you monitor your dev environment by any chance? No, it's dev. Why would, that's a waste of resources. Yeah, that's not a waste of resources. Because nothing against developers. I have some good friends that are developers. But most developers, yeah, they don't really focus on security. You know, they're under time deadlines. They're under a lot of pressure to get product out. So they, you know, do a lot of work in dev. And a lot of that work isn't focused on security. Well, if you're not monitoring that, you know, what happens if there's, you know, somebody who gets into the dev environment and then they pivot outside the dev environment? You know, hopefully you'll see it at that point, but what if you don't? So you have to monitor more than what you might consider critical. Also, what about upstream and downstream partners? Now, obviously, you can't go in and monitor their systems, but are you monitoring where they come in? Are you seeing what they're doing and making sure that any accounts that they have, you're specifically looking at? You know, what if you have, I don't know, an HVAC contractor and you're not really paying attention to what they're doing? Or 
hypothetically, if you might be a retailer. Um, thank you. Nice. I like what you did there. Um, but yeah, I mean, are you monitoring that? Oh, it's just an HVAC company. You know, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with our critical data. Our critical data. Any way that you can get into a company should be critical to you, and you should be watching that. So, an overview. Let's look at some old practices. And I have old practices in there. Unfortunately, a lot of companies, this is still the practice. So, phase one, buy sim. Phase two, phase three, detection. Well, unfortunately, that's the way it is, or at least the way it used to be. And unfortunately, it's still like that a lot of times. People will buy monitoring and detection program or products. I just go out and spend a quarter of a million dollars on this sim. And I have it, and I throw it in, and now I'm going to be good to go. I'm monitoring everything. Yay! It doesn't work like that. And when you talk to people and you say, yeah, you need to do more than just grab this product, spend your quarter of a million dollars on it, put it in, and just expect something to happen. They're like, so? I have a sim. You know, that's my monitoring right there. What's wrong? Well, if you just do that, you are so blind in most areas that you're not seeing a lot of the stuff you should be. And the next thing I hear a lot is, well, we, we do tune our sim. And, you know, we think that our content's pretty good. You know what? We get a report every morning that shows us what happened. Okay, congratulations. You get a report every morning. What happens on, I don't know, Thanksgiving? When people are gone Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and you get your report on Monday, sweet. Your report's going to say you're screwed because you waited for something to hit you in the morning with pretty dashboards because that's what the, you know your boss wants, but it doesn't, it's not alerting. Getting a report is not alerting. Phase two is what's so critical. Another old way, a sim is a checkbox tool. I'm not even going to talk about that. It makes me angry. So some old practices when you get a little bit deeper into it. Default content that isn't tuned. And this is a real big pet peeve of mine. So you purchase a sim and you say, you know what, we're going to go ahead and have professional services come in and help us get this thing up and running. So you have 40 hours of professional services. Well, that 40 hours of professional services usually also includes them coming in, setting up the environment, doing the engineering work on it, making sure that whatever it is that you tell them is supposed to be going to the sim, which may not be everything, um, is going in there. And then whatever time they have left after that is focused on training you how to use the product and then whatever you know customization off of that that you want. All sims come with default content. But you can't just assume that because you have this default content that it's actually working for you the way it should. Most default content relies on some variables that are specific to each organization. So you have to actually take that default content and still work with it. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with default content in any sim. But you can't just assume because it's in there that it's going to work for you. Old content that's broken. And what I mean by that is, if, if you've worked in a sim before and you're trying to create content, you know, a lot of times it doesn't work the first time. So you're working on it. You go test it, hopefully. And it's not working. So you go back and you try to mess with it. And then you say, okay, you know what? I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to go a different route and try this. Well, the more stale content you have in there, it hits the performance of your sim. And it can also, depending on how you have it correlating and what rules are applying to what, you can actually break good content if you have that stale content in there. And the other one is alerting that's not reporting correctly. So let's say, okay, we're not doing the daily report thing anymore because that sounds like a bad idea. But I want to make sure that I get an alert off of X, Y, and, or an email off of X, Y, and Z, or just any kind of flashy alert. Have you tested it to make sure it works? Because you can create content all day long, and you say, I want to be alerted anytime Jason Street walks in the building. Well, if Jason doesn't walk into the building, how do you know it's going to work? So you 3D print Jason and push him through and see if it alerts. But anyway, you've got to make sure that that alerting is working. I've seen a lot of times 
people set something up. And then, yeah, you know what? I created this content and I have this thing that's supposed to email me, but this event happened, I never got the email. All right, let's look into it. Oh, you know what? You don't have any email server information here at all. So how is it going to email you? Okay, well, I fixed that. I'm still not getting it. Okay, cool. Have you worked with your infrastructure people to make sure they've actually opened the ports to allow you to do that? One second. Hello? Sorry. I thought I heard somebody come in. I thought maybe the door was locked. So anyway, you know, you can't just assume things when you're dealing with any kind of product like that. Boom. So let's look at the right way to do things. By a sim, phase two, is tune, tune, tune. You have to take whatever it is that you're investing the money and resources in and do more than just throw it in and expect that it's going to do something for you. You actually have to get into that content. You have to look to see what's default and actually you know, make sure it works in your environment. And it's not just a one-time thing. Your sim is your baby. Would you ever stop feeding your baby? Where do you get the content? Good question. So I'll talk about default first, and then later on we're going to go into like actually doing content. So let's start. Let's start with default content. All right? Mentioned before that yes, it comes in there, and yes, it can be good. But a lot of times you still need to put in the environment your uh, variables for your own environment. A lot of the content that is really good, that's canned, is pretty, the logic's pretty complex. So you actually have to put in like a network range, for example, or other correlating factors. And if you don't put that in, that default content will not work. So you tune it. When I was talking before about, you know, feeding it, Let's say you go through and you have a project that is just going to go through and tune out, you know, tune all the good default content. And then after you have that done, you create content that's specific for your environment. Awesome. So I've spent a month on this project. I'm getting everything I should do. This is great. I'm working awesome. Okay. You are for now. But again, would you ever stop feeding your baby? A, t a, a sim or any other monitoring device is a living, breathing animal that you have to continuously give care and feeding to. So, sim content. Again, make sure that, oh, this slide is not supposed to be in here. That's okay. Default content, again, make sure it's tuned and configured correctly. We've talked about clearing stale content because it'll improve performance, and if you don't, it can affect good content. Most importantly here, though, again, Test all the content. Test the rules you create. Test the alerts that you have. Test everything that you do. Let's say that a new attack vector comes out and your sim is robust enough to actually, you know, start looking for specific things that you can alert on. Well, and you create the content for that. You're like, you know what? I just saw this on Twitter and we developed content for it, so we're gonna, if that happens to us, we're gonna know because I created the content for it. Sweet, you created the content. Did you test it? Because, you know, maybe somewhere in the logic of the, of the content you wrote, you missed something. Or maybe, you know, you followed, you know, a, an article somewhere on how to do it. Well, maybe the person who wrote that article forgot to put a step in or what have you. So creating content, especially customized things, is great, but you have to test it to make sure it's actually going to work for you. Yes, sir. Good question. So my favorite response to things like this is situation's going to dictate. What I mean by that is if you have so I'm sorry. So the question is when it comes to tuning content, who's actually the one doing that? Is that the SOC analyst or like an engineer? And that's going to depend on your organization. Now, if you have people who actually are like sim engineers and you have SOC analysts and you have a couple of different levels that are involved with the sim, 
I would recommend that the sim engineers are the ones who are actually creating the content. Now, the SOC analysts need to be involved, though, because they're the ones who are going to be, you know, using that data to escalate incidents or what have you. But the ones who are actually, if you have engineers for your sim, those are the guys who actually should be doing the content. Does that answer your question? Cool. Oh, no problem. So let's look at incident response. And I'll get into why I have some stuff on incident response a little bit later on. But it is actually very important in your monitoring program. So let's look at typical incident response plans. So let's look at good ones. The content is regularly updated. Escalation points and contact info, both internal and external, are in there. Trigger points are included because you can't just have a plan and do certain, you know, just read it and run. There, there has to be some trigger points in there that say, okay, if we see, if we get notification of a breach from a third party, we need to start here. We go through these steps, these steps, these steps. Now, once we hit this point, we should also do this. So that's what I mean by uh, trigger points. The plan is actually reviewed and practiced with the key players or business units. You can't just have a really great plan that you may have even paid somebody to come in and they created an outstanding incident response plan for you. If you don't at least test it, look at it, and have the key players involved, then if and when you have a breach, it's not going to be worth anything. And it's more than just IT folks, whether it's InfoSec or infrastructure or whatever IT silo you want to throw in there. It's a lot of other areas, and we'll cover that in a little bit. The guidelines are in your plan are typical scenarios that you're more than likely going to see, but it has to be flexible for the atypical scenarios that could pop up. So your incident response plan should be more, it's, it should be a guideline. Right? So a guideline guides you. It doesn't say, when this happens, do this. When this happens, do this. Because it will never, ever happen in that kind of order or in the way that whoever wrote the plan, no matter how good they are, you can't just look at it and read it and go step by step. It will never work like that. Real quick, I, I do want to cover this here. So people who should be involved in the plan. So. I've, I've talked to this about this before, and people say, well, okay, we understand it needs to be more than IT. Well, who? Who should be involved then? In general, and these, this is just loose, whoever is in your legal department is a representative. Corporate communications, human resources, whoever handles your insurance policies, upstream and downstream partners, perhaps, depending on what your organization does and what industry you're in. You know, these are the folks that need to be in your incident response plan because if a breach does happen, they're going to have involvement. They're going to need to be involved. Now, the challenge for most folks is getting not only buy-in from these people, but also getting them to be involved, to participate in the plan if you have a test on it. Because just as importantly, if you're an InfoSec and there's a breach, and you need to know what your role is. It's equally as important that other people in business units know what to do as well. So a bad plan. There's a high level overview and it's outdated types of incidents. You know, here's what we do if we see this worm. You know, those kind of things. If a computer gets a virus, here's how we handle that computer. The plans aren't updated regularly. So you'll have you know, Joe Smith, and he is the chief information security officer, and his phone number is X. Well, he hasn't been with the company for five years, but his information is still in there. And he's the primary point of contact in this plan. And although the plans may be recertified on an annual basis, typically they're still stale. This I've seen a lot, specifically in financial institutions, because they deal with so many other regulatory compliance that when it comes to internal recertification, it usually goes like this. 
take a look at this plan and you know just sign off on it have you reviewed the plan I have read the incident response plan and I know my role plan is recertified that happens more times than you would think an ugly plan a couple pages of outdated contact info it's based loosely off of a disaster recovery plan and it doesn't offer any real value to be honest with you this kind of plan you should just kill it with fire it's not going to do any good for you and it's actually going to be worse if you actually have to do anything with an incident of any kind because you're going to go to this plan thinking you know what it may not be the best but I'm going to use this and you start to try to figure out and everyone who gets involved in an incident if you've never been involved in one before everyone is kind of like hair on fire and especially with a lot of alphas who are involved in the plan everyone wants to be in charge regardless of who the incident commander is going to be and when you have a plan that's ugly like this it turns into a giant cluster instead of you know what take that thing it's worthless get rid of it and you know go on the fly that's not the best thing to do but it's honestly a lot better than trying to follow a plan like this let's look at some incident response failures plans that are either too stringent or stringent to be effective or the information planning or has the good information and planning to be effective now on the first part what I mean by that is there's some plans that are written that are more like step by step by step and you can have an incident response plan that is a giant book well our we rehearse this plan and when this happens we do number one and then we go to number two like I said before it's never gonna be that easy it's ne you're never gonna have an incident that you can just walk through and look at a checklist and follow the directions so there has to be flexibility in a plan. That's what I was saying before. Your plan should be a guideline. Key players in the organization aren't involved or they don't know their role in an incident. Again, HR, legal, all these other areas need to be involved. But if they don't know what they're supposed to do, they may have read the plan, but if they don't really understand or know what they're supposed to do, it's going to be a cluster. And the biggest thing I, I, I look at in this that drives me crazy it's not updated and practiced it is not going to do you any good if you have a great plan but no one's doing anything with it you need to rehearse that plan with at least the key players from the different units that are going to be involved and it has to be updated if Joe Smith leaves that plan should be updated that should be part of what you do for like an uh, when somebody leaves okay we're terminating the accounts doing all this other stuff contacting HR update the, is, uh, the incident response plan so story time wow this is a lot tinier on my screen so there once was a company in a faraway land that thought they had an incident response plan for the ages while they slumbered in their beds, the evil APTs from China snuck in to try to steal their IP. When they awoke to the alarms of intrusion and despair, sorry, they reached for the IR plan of gold. When they blew off the dust and opened the plan, prepared for battle, no one knew where to start. The plan had grown old, the power no more. All the knights of the fair company began to scurry and scamper. Communications broke down. Help could not be raised. The castle was falling. While they scampered, the evil APTs from China scurried away with all they held dear. Not Russian. The end. Not Russian this time. So, this story is specifically based on an incident that uh, I was involved with where there was not a good plan um, unfortunately to say it actually was China involved 
Um, and while they ran around frantically trying to figure out what they should do and where they should start, at this point they, they were not just owned. It wasn't just like domain admin and blah, blah, blah. No, they had the keys to the kingdom. They had data. They had R&D data. They had everything. They basically could, they were basically, I am now company X. You guys can go ahead and move along because this is mine now. So the moral of the story, instant response plans must have buy-in and involvement from key players. When an incident happens, is not time to try to figure out what do. And a plan should be minimum, at minimum, reviewed and preferably rehearsed regularly. Now, the variable of regularly is dependent upon what you can actually get accomplished in your company. Minimum, the minimum I personally feel is on an annual basis. Now, if you can get at least the key players to participate more than that, that's awesome. Congratulations, because just trying to get everyone involved in for a one-year time frame is difficult. But it needs to happen. And that's why I, I really focus on the buy-in from, you know, the men upstairs or women upstairs. You know, the people who aren't in the technical silos, but they want a plan because, you know, they're reading the news and they're like, crap, I don't want to be insert big name here. I don't want that to happen to us, so we need to do X, Y, and Z. Okay, cool. Here's what I need from you. I need a point of contact for this. We need to do this, that, and the other. Oh, well, no. Instant response plan. That's that's for you technical guys. I don't, I don't understand that. You don't have to understand the technical part, but you need to understand what your role is. So that's the hardest part. And it's a challenge that, you know, somebody needs to pick up the sword and go fight for that. Because without that, you're going to have a bad time. Now, these are just suggestions. This is not an end-all list of what should be included in an incident response plan. So keep that in mind. Creating a plan based on real threats that you're monitoring in your company, what's going on in the wild, and situations that can affect your company. Again, outdated plan that just says if a computer gets a virus, here's what we do. No. It should be based on actually what you're monitoring because that's your first line of defense is your monitoring and detection program. So if you have that established and you have that uh, good monitoring and detection program, you build that into your incident response plan. So you can actually have trigger points on certain types of events that you see. Because it's a good starting point because whatever happens in an incident, you're going to have to go back to whatever log sources you have to start your investigation. So that's why you really need to tie your monitoring and detection program into your incident response plan. Again, identify and include key players from all areas. And then you need to think about what kind of data you need in case, in case of a breach in order to even start the investigation. And, you know, different scenarios are going to dictate what kind of data you need. But you're always going to need, you know, the basics at least. You know, who was it that came in? Well, you know, what's the internal, external IP? You know, was there any communication from the initial entry point to any other systems? You know, that kind of information is stuff you're always going to use. But, you know, start thinking about other situations where, okay, well, let's see, if something in dev gets popped, I'm going to need, um, you know, whatever else is on that box. I'm going to need to look in production for that system that got popped to see if they went from, they found old creds there, that they went over here. You know, those kind of things. How are you going to communicate internally and externally in the event that you have a breach? Are you going to use email? Hell no. If you've been popped, you need to, you know, plan for the best, or plan for the worst, hope for the best. So you need to plan on that they own your email. So don't use it. You have to figure out something else. Figure out other ways to communicate. You know, set up, you know, fake email addresses that are uh, off, you know, Gmail or whatever it is that you want to use. But you can't, you, you can't rely on your internal email. How are you going to prevent the data from actually leaving your company? 
once you have that figured out, you know, whatever it is, if you're going to do, uh, you know, pull the plug, shut down certain firewalls, whatever it is that you're going to do, you also have to have, identify how you're going to do that across your entire organization, synced up to basically execute at the same time. Because let's say you have a global organization and you have the bad guys just running rampant entire and throughout the entire company in multiple geographic locations. Well, if you shut down your U.S. operations, not shut down the U.S. operations, but, you know, try to purge them from the U.S. at the same, or uh, here, but you're not trying to do the exact same thing somewhere else, then as soon as you shut down the U.S. operations, they're going to see that. And they're going to start building up their defenses. They're going to start doing whatever it is they can to survive. Think of it as, you know, an actual human virus. You know, if you attack it, it's going to do whatever it can to survive. And that's what's going to happen with any intruder inside your organization. So you have to figure out, A, how, you know, what's the best thing for our company to start purging them, but you need to figure out how you can do that simultaneously. Think about what would happen if you got a call right now saying you've been breached. I mean, I know a lot of people have thought, you know, oh, if we get breached, you know, I'm going to do this, and our plan says that. But no, I mean, really think about the FBI shows up at your door and says, we found your intellectual property on servers that we're monitoring. Here are some IPs of those servers. See you later. That's exactly what happens when the FBI shows up at your door because they found something. Don't expect any help from them. And it's nothing against, I'm not knocking the FBI in any way, but that's not their job. Their job is not to jump in and help you do the forensics. Their job is not to, you know, take down a foreign national server. Their job is to at least let you know, hey, you've been owned, potentially. So you need to figure out what to do now. So I did a, an uh, incident response uh, drill scenario, whatever you want to call it, at a conference in April. And the conference was actually based exact, or the uh, incident response scenario was based on that specifically. Which to me was funny because I've worked with another company that had an incident that that's how they found out. Um, FBI just showed up. We, you know, we got a call. Uh, yeah, FBI just showed up and they said that they found our X data on servers in X region. We need help. They won't do anything. Okay, did they give you any information? Yeah, okay, well, we'll come on site. Let's see, let's figure out what's going on. So they spent the first half hour. Now, they have people crawling in their network everywhere. And they spent the first half hour with us complaining about how much they are, how upset they are that the FBI was doing nothing to help them. I'm like, okay, well, that's not their job. They need to do, you know, some other things. Well, yeah, but they know we've been breached. They should be helped. No. So half an hour of that to the point where finally we had to say, listen, give us everything they have and let us start working. So delivery. <laughs> I'm a little offended there's no pizza, but that's okay. Um, so... So anyway, yeah, they're, uh, I mean, think about that. that. That's how it happens when the FBI shows up at your door. Unless you're Jared, but that's a different situation. Um, too soon? Come on, it's not too soon. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, think about that situation. Think about what happens if you go back to work and on Monday the FBI shows up at your door. What are you going to do? Because, again, they're not there to help you. They're there to let you know that something bad has happened. And, again, regu regularly, I always hate that word, test and evaluate your plan. I have beat that to death, so I don't have to go over that anymore. So, adaptive monitoring detection. We spend millions on technology. Now most of that money is actually finally going towards security. Big round of applause for you all, because 
finally, after years and years and years and years of begging, we're starting to get some money. It's important to not only have this technology, but you need to configure it correctly and monitor it correctly. So if you have an, a, a product that's important enough that you spent a lot of money on it, why would you not make sure that you're using it properly? You know, the same example I gave, uh, for example, a SIM, where you buy it, professional services comes in, they help you out, they'll train you, and then, you know, they'll start doing whatever customizations or whatever you want with it. Same thing happens, you know, with the new toys that we can now play with. So, yeah, it's set up. Yeah, there's good stuff they can do. But you need to do some work in it to make sure it works in your environment. Because default content is just that. It's default. It's generic for any place that they put the box in. IDS, IPS, KIDS, Next Gen, Product X are good tools and they're not cheap. If you're going to spend the time and money on them, you know, you should be configuring them properly. And after you get that done, is it configured to set the, send the right logs? Hi. So what do I mean by that? So you know, now that we have these cool tools and we have our SIM and our SIM is tuned and we're rocking. We're like, yeah, send everything. I don't care what it is, send it all to the SIM. I'm going to monitor all the things. Cool. What you're going to do is take your SOC analyst and they're going to look at it and just kind of drool's going to be coming out of this side of the mouth and blood's going to be coming out of this eye. And one of two things is going to happen. They're going to spend a lot of time tuning on their end because you're sending everything from this system. They're going to spend a lot of time on their end tuning that out. Or if they don't have the time to do all that, which they probably don't, they're going to just basically start ignoring all the noise that's coming from this brand new, very expensive, really cool product. So in essence, it's a waste now. You spend all this time and money on it, you're sending everything to the sim, but there's so much stuff going into the sim, they're going to stop watching. And if there's any SOC analysts in here who have had this happen, you can just sit there and shake your head and go, yeah, because I'm not going to watch everything. So just as important as tuning stuff out in the sim is sending the right stuff to the sim. And lastly on this one, is your sim set up, or if you have an MSSP, are they set up to correctly take in, correlate, and alert on these devices? So when you have a SIM, you have some intelligence behind it, right? It knows how to take in a log, how to parse that information correctly to have the, manage, the, the SIM management unit look at it, correlate on it, and send out the proper alerts. Well, if you have next-gen product X, is there a way for your SIM to parse that data? Or is it just going to go, oh, it's syslog, generic syslog tag. And then you have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of alerts a day of generic syslog. That's not going to do you any good either. So when you're thinking about these products, when you're thinking about next gen product X, you know, you need to look at your SIM, or if you have an MSSP, talk to them and say, hey, I'm looking at getting this. Is there a plug-in or whatever your SIM happens to call it? They'll actually aggregate and parse these logs correctly so we can actually get good content built in the SIM itself. Because if you don't do that, it's going to be very challenging. You're not going to really get the bang for the buck of that new shiny box. So, purple team. Woohoo! Incorporating pen testing into monitoring. If you take one thing away from this presentation, take that away. Pen tests are one of the best tools that you can use to actually improve your and adapt your monitoring and detection, period. These are real world examples of somebody breaking into your environment. I mean, you can't ask for anything better. As a blue teamer, as a SOC analyst or engineer, this is the best thing that can happen for you because you're going to be able to actually see what happened, who, how they got in, 
Do I, how, why didn't I see this? Okay, cool. Now I need to fix it. Now, you don't need to focus on the entire penetration test report. You don't have to focus on the remediation side of the house unless you're also involved in that. You need to focus on the technical findings themselves. So when you do that, going back to content creation, take that information and actually start building your content off of that. You know that the pen test person got in this way and you didn't alert on it. So if it was a third party vendor, you know, when you start your engagement, when you start discussing your engagement, let them know that along with the technical findings, and you, you're going to probably have to pay a little bit more for this, but it's worth it. Along with the technical findings and the remediation steps, we have SIM product X. Anything that you find, we would like to, on our own, create content for that. So in your technical findings, can you also, you know, perhaps make a suggestion on how the content should be created? You know, it's not a bad idea. Again, you're going to probably pay extra for it. And if you can't get away with paying extra for that, that's fine. If you have any internal red team resources, work with them to say, hey, I need to build this content here because we got popped here. And I'm going to write this content based on what I see here. But I need you to test it. I need you to test it to make sure that what I just wrote, because it's something completely brand new for us, I need to make sure that it actually works. And... You know, since I have the little purple team slide up there, on a side note, how, uh, how many SOC analysts or SOC engineers or anyone who watches the screens, how many of you all are in here? Okay, not a bad amount. So, raise your hand if you would love to know when a pen test is coming. Okay, no, honest responses. That's honest. You know why? Because it makes us look good. You know what? I want to know when it's coming because I'm really going to be watching for this. That way I can say, you know what? Oh, look, look, we caught you. We're good. Um, so I used to be uh, on the monitoring detection side of a, of a bank in Ohio. And we knew it was that time of year that a pen test was coming. So I started, my, my boss had his calendar to share to our group, but he had to share everything. So I'm looking and I'm watching. I'm like, and he's like, he's a typical manager manager, right? So everything has the notes and the details and who I'm meeting with and what company they're from. So I'm just watching his calendar, watching his calendar. And then I see introductory call with company X. And we only use that company for one thing, doing a pen test. So I'm watching, I'm like, okay, it's coming really soon. And then there's another meeting on there final call with company X. Okay, so I open up the, the calendar thing, and it has the date and time the pen test is going to start, the location at a branch where they're going to start the work. So I tell my buddy, I said, all right, we can't look so good that instantly we find them, so let's give them like a minute or two, <laughs> right? Let's, we don't want to raise any red flags for that. So... We go through, and we find them, and yeah, look how good we are. All right. It's good because it makes us feel good, and it, you know, it shows that we can do really good things. At the end of the day, that's absolutely the wrong thing to do. We should not ever want to know when a pen test is happening because it doesn't do us any good as blue teamers. It doesn't. And, you know, whoever you report to as a blue team or if a pen test comes back and they come to you and you're like, why didn't we see this? Why didn't we see this, that, and the other? Number one, if it's something that's common that you should have configured right, they're right. Why didn't you see it? But if it's not, then you say, you know what? You're right. And I'm so glad we had this pen test done because now I can see where our gap is and I can actually fix that gap. So this is great for us. I'm so glad we had this pen test. And if you have a good manager, they should understand that, respect that. But should never, if unless you overhear it, don't look for when a pen test happens. You should want it to happen without your knowledge. So I have to speed it up a little bit. I've been gabbing way too much. So, threat intelligence. Yeah, it's a flashy buzzword, but it actually does have a place in monitoring and detection. So by incorporating, by uh, actually, Taking the feeds that you get for threat intelligence, regardless what it is, 
It's going to improve your monitoring program and decrease the response time. And what I mean by that is not just, you know, hey, we're seeing these new hashes that indicate this, you know, vector. It's not just the real raw technical side of threat intelligence. I'm talking more like the actual intelligence. Like, there's an organization that is focusing on manufacturing, specifically, let's say, automotive, because we're here in, you know, in the Detroit area. Well, that's something that we need to know. We need to start tracking, you know, whoever's making these claims. See if, what else they've done in the past. Who have they hit before? How did they hit them? And then start focusing on putting content in there to actually monitor for that. Taking the information you gather can monitor threats in your company and industry. Again, we just kind of hit on that. And if you have a SIM, you can create content based on this intel. Again, if bad, bad hacker group X has made claims against your industry or your company, and they have a history of using this exploit or using this uh, kind of phishing attack, start looking for that. Create content on that. Um, Mick Douglas, this slide's for you, by the way. So what's going on in the wild? So here, here, I'm assuming everybody, I'm hoping, who here keeps tabs on what's going out, going on in the wild regularly? Okay. Now, take that and look at these new indicators of compromise or these new threat vectors or whatever it is and think about your monitoring. Are you monitoring for anything remotely close to that? You know, use that knowledge. Start monitoring for anything you can regarding that. Again, a SIM or any monitoring platform at all is your baby. You have to keep feeding your baby and taking care of your baby. You can adapt your monitoring to include these new threats. And again, you should always be tuning your content for what's going on out there. However, that being said, the question I get a lot is, well, that sounds great, but there's so much stuff that happens all the time. How am I supposed to create content for everything? Know your environment. Know what's pertinent to you. And look at risks that are going to affect your organization, your industry, maybe upstream or downstream industries, and focus on that. If you see something that, like, new indicator compromise and attack vector that specifically targets healthcare. Well, if you're not in healthcare, don't spin your wheels on that one. Go on to what matters for you. So, tying it all together. Monitoring and detection is your primary line of defense. Firewalls, next-gen product X, different, you know, intrusion detection devices are an important component of that, but your monitoring and detection is actually what ties everything together. If you want to get the most protection you can for the keys of your kingdom, you really need to have a solid program in place. You have to pay attention to what's going on. Never stop tuning your content. And start thinking outside the box when it comes to actually creating your content, sending logs to your monitoring system. Don't send too much. Send what's needed, because otherwise your SIM analysts or your SOC analysts are just going to start bleeding from the eyes. So. TLDR, what did we learn? Improvise, adapt, overcome. That's the key to this whole thing. Think outside the box. Think about what you can do in your organization beyond just writing this kind of content and, you know, relying on default stuff. So since I'm in Detroit, I had to throw in the gratuitous RoboCop reference. I want to thank you all for your cooperation. You are the best, and I have... Five minutes for questions. So, questions. Woohoo! Yes, sir. Yep. Agreed. Yeah, so the, so the comment was, which was a really good comment, was, you know, when tuning's discussed, you know, it's, there's a big, and I'm paraphrasing, I might be butchering it, but, you know, what's included in tuning? And use cases, the proper use of use cases is going to give you the information you need to start your tuning. In essence, is that roughly yeah, close? Yeah, right? Okay. Yeah. Anyone else with questions? Mr. Street. Uh, Muted's going to talk about...
creating uh, like false flags to help them see them? It's like uh, do wrestling does you know, increase specialism of what those are? So the question is, uh, there was another talk that recommended like false flags um, in your sim and, uh, you know, discussing them, my thoughts on them, and discussing them a little bit more. Are you talking like, uh, so to... Right. Yeah, so it, it's almost, so basically what you're describing is like, uh, almost like a honeypot for your sim to set stuff up. Yes, I do recommend doing that. Um, a lot of times what we do is anytime anything happens with a domain account, or it, when I used to not do MSSP work and I worked for a real company, um, we used to do that. So specific accounts, now they weren't false flag accounts, but specific accounts, anytime anything happened with them was like super uber critical red flag. But no, that is a very good idea. Anyone else? Yes, sir. So the question is, what are good resources for tuning? Um, First and foremost, whatever documentation for your sim specifically, so you know how to create, start as a baseline to create your content, right? Because you need to know how to apply the logic and things like that. So number one, that's where I would start. Number two, to be completely honest with you, when it comes to stuff like that, I love Google, I love YouTube, and I love, you know, different blogs. Because you might see something, let's say you use ArcSight, and... Q Radar had, just comes out with something to say, you know, in a blog or what have you that says, here's how you tune up, you know, Q Radar to do this new cool detection method. Okay, well, you can't do those steps in ArcSight, for example. However, you can take that same logic and start applying it to um, whatever sim you have. So, honestly, not only following your vendor for your sim, but follow the other big guys too, because you can still get good information from that. Any other questions? All right, I'm at my limit. Uh, thank everyone. I want to thank everyone for being here. Thank the sponsors. Thank the conference. Peace.